Hey, welcome back to the channel everybody. This is Kevin and in this week's video, we're going to cover absolutely everything you need to know about BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol for Cisco's new Encore exam. That's exam 350-401. Now BGP, that's one of those topics that has tended to strike fear, uncertainty and doubt into the hearts of many a CCIE candidate. I know it did for me. When I was getting my first CCIE way back in 2001, I printed out Cisco's documentation from their website on BGP. It was this thick document and I read that thing cover to cover because there were so many options and features and ways to do BGP configuration. It kind of shocked people when a few years ago, Cisco added BGP to the CCNA exam. It's the now older CCNA exam, 200-125. But when I really looked at what they were asking for on that old exam blueprint of the old CCNA, I thought it was a really good idea because they were showing at candidates that you could have two BGP neighbors establish that neighborship, exchange network information, and you could do that with just three commands per router. That's right, just three commands. Now, in the current version of CCNA, BGP is nowhere to be seen, but it does show up in the Encore exam. Again, Encore, that's 350-401. That's the core exam for the CCNP Enterprise certification. And it also serves as the quote unquote written exam for the new CCIE Enterprise Infrastructure Lab. You take this Encore exam first, and then you get to go take the lab. But in this video, we're gonna focus on what you need to know for the Encore exam based on their blueprint regarding BGP. And it's really not that bad. What you need to be able to do is have a couple of routers establish a BGP neighborship between them and exchange routes, just like you used to have to do on the old CCNA exam. But it goes a little bit further than that. We have to also understand how BGP makes its path selection decisions. BGP does not just have a simple metric like OSPF that's going to make its forwarding decisions based on bandwidth and running the Dijkstra algorithm. BGP has lots of path attributes and we need to know what those path attributes are in what order they're examined and what they mean. At the end of this video, I want you to be able to look at the output of a show IP BGP command and tell me if there's more than one way to get to a specific network, who's going to be chosen first, who's going to be chosen second and why, and maybe who's going to be chosen third and fourth. And tell me why those are going to be the third and fourth choices. Because all of that information with the path attributes, all that can be found in the output of the show IP BGP command. And we're going to master that here in this video. But let's begin by taking a look at some of the basic characteristics of BGP. One thing that makes BGP unique is that it is considered to be an exterior gateway protocol as opposed to an interior gateway protocol. We use the term autonomous system or an AS to describe a network under a single administrative control. For example, your company might have their autonomous system. You connect out to a service provider. They're in their own autonomous system. And for redundancy, you connect out to another service provider. They're in their own autonomous system. When you're routing between autonomous systems, that's where you need an exterior gateway protocol. And BGP is the one that's in use today. There was an older one, and it was actually called EGP. And that's right. We had an EGP that was named EGP. But these days, it's strictly BGP that we're going to be using as an exterior gateway protocol. And much like OSPF and EIGRP, we do form neighborships. But what is different in some cases is we need to specify the IP address of our neighbor. We're not going to be sending out these multicast hello messages to say, hey, are there any neighbors out there? Let me introduce myself and we dynamically form these neighborships. No, I need to say, I want to point to a neighbor that lives in this autonomous system and here is their IP address. That's a little bit different than we did with OSPF and EIGRP. Something else that makes BGP unique is that it establishes a TCP session between these two routers. That's uncommon for a routing protocol. Specifically, it's going to be using TCP port 179. And when we talk about sending route information or network information from one router to another router, we say that that address information and the prefix information, in other words, how many bits in the address refer to the network, we say that is called NLRI, Network Layer Reachability Information. And we might think, isn't this just a route advertisement? Why are we being all fancy and calling it Network Layer Reachability Information? Well, in one of those BGP update messages, we send more than just the NLRI. 
We also send any routes that we want to withdraw from our table, and we also send path attributes. And speaking of path attributes, that's what BGP is going to use in order to determine which path to select when it has more than one way to get to a particular destination network. And there are several of them as we're going to be discussing. And while we say that OSPF falls under the category of a link state routing protocol and RIP is a distance vector routing protocol, and we oftentimes say that EIGRP is an advanced distance vector routing protocol, ISIS, that's another link state routing protocol, well, BGP is kind of in its own category. It's a path vector routing protocol. What does that mean? Well, think about a vector. Remember from high school, you learned what a vector was. It carries two pieces of information. It carries magnitude and direction. And that's what we talk about when we discuss RIP or EIGRP or these distance vector routing protocols. They don't have a map of the entire network like OSPF and ISIS do. Instead, they know their next hop. They have a vector pointing, go in this direction if you want to get to this network. And with RIP and EIGRP, there's this metric that says, okay, how far away is it? What is the distance to this network? Well, here with BGP, we're still going to be identifying the next hop to get to a destination network. And we do not have a map of the entire topology like we would see with OSPF. But we do have something that's a bit different. Notice the path in path vector routing protocol. Well, the path is talking about the autonomous systems that we have to go through in order to get to our destination network. We can literally see that to get to this network, I'm going to go through this autonomous system, then I'll go through this one, then I'll go through this one, and finally I'm going to go into this autonomous system, and that's where my network lives. Now, the first thing we want to do before we go out and do the configuration is talk about BGP's path selection algorithm. And there's a little bit of a gray area here because if you go out and read the documentation, because some documentation will identify about eight different path attributes that BGP might use to make a path selection decision. Other documentation might identify nine or 11. The most I've ever seen is 13. But several of those rarely, if ever, get used. Probably the most common memory aid for BGP path selection is this acrostic. It's we love oranges as oranges mean pure refreshment. We love oranges as oranges mean pure refreshment. If you've studied BGP for any length of time, you've probably heard that. But do you really understand it? Can you explain what each of those eight different path attributes mean? And just as important, can you identify those eight different path attributes within the output of the show IP BGP command? That's what we're going to do in this video. But let's first get a better understanding of what these eight different path attributes mean, beginning with weight. Now, weight is something we just see on Cisco routers. It's a Cisco-specific path attribute, and it doesn't get communicated to anybody else in the autonomous system. So we say it's locally significant. It's a value that's only going to be examined by one router. And let's say that router has one path to one internet service provider and another path to another internet service provider. And one link is faster than the other, and we want to influence our packets to go over that faster link as they go out to the internet. What we could do is use a route map and assign a higher weight to routes learned from that neighbor available over the faster link, and we can assign a lower weight, the default weight is zero by the way, we can assign a lower weight to networks being learned over that slower neighbor. But again, this is Cisco proprietary, and honestly what I use most for influencing outbound path selection decisions is this. It's local preference. Here, it, we're not Cisco proprietary anymore, and we are communicating this value throughout our autonomous system. And just like weight, higher is better. And just like weight, we can use a route map to say, when I'm getting a route advertisement from this neighbor, I'm going to assign it this local preference, and I'll give a higher value to my preferred neighbor and a lower value to my backup neighbor. Now, one of the things that is a bit confusing about we love oranges as oranges mean pure refreshment, there are two uses of the word orange. We have two path attributes that begin with an O. And the first one is originate. Now, there's a lot of confusion about this. There's a lot of literature out there that will lead you down the wrong path. So let me just simplify this for you. Basically, all we're saying with originate is a router is going to prefer a route if we injected it into BGP. If it was sourced locally from us, then yeah, we're going to prefer that over something learned from somebody else, obviously. That's really all we need to worry about with originate. Now, how do you know it was sourced from us? Well, in the output of that show IP BGP command, we're going to see that the next top is all zeros. 
0.0.0.0. That means us. That means it was originated locally. But let's say that we have these two different ways of getting to a network. They have an equal weight. They have an equal local preference. Neither originated locally. What do we do now? We look at the autonomous system path length. How many autonomous systems do we have to travel through in order to get to this destination network? I hate to say it, but this is a little bit like RIP, where we used hop count to determine who is the best path. Well, here we're saying if everything else is equal, then we're going to go with the path that has the shortest number of autonomous systems that we have to transit to get to this destination network. What if that's a tie? Well, here comes the second use of the word oranges in our acrostic. This O stands for origin type or origin code. We can use those terms synonymously. And this is another one of those path attributes that there's a lot of confusion about. The temptation is to look at this and to look at the output of the command of show IP BGP and think that, okay, if I have an origin type of I, then it was injected by an in-tier gateway writing protocol, like OSPF or like EIGRP. And if it's an E, it was injected by an exterior gateway writing protocol, like BGP. Or if it's unknown, it's going to be a question mark. That's really not a good practical way of looking at this. Here's the way I want you to view this. If the origin code or the origin type is an I, that means that BGP first learned about this route using the network command on some router out there. It might not have been our router, but some router had a network command that said, I want to advertise this network into BGP. If there's an E, then you might want to blink your eyes and refocus because I don't think you'll ever see an E here as the origin code. The origin code of E literally means the older, the way outdated EGP, EGP, the exterior gateway protocol that was actually named EGP. I don't know of anybody that has used that for decades, so I highly doubt that you'll ever see an E there. And the question mark does not mean that this came from some unknown mystical source. It means that, oh, BGP learned about this through a redistribution. Maybe we redistributed static or connected or EIGRP or OSPF routes into BGP. Those are going to show up with a question mark, simply meaning redistributed. So that's a totally different way of looking at origin codes or origin types than you might have heard in the past. But that's how I want you to think about this for the real world. Now, BGP does have, I guess we could call it a quote-unquote metric. When you hear about a BGP metric, we're talking about the MED, the multi-exit discriminator. But this is not something that even gets considered until we have a tie with weight and local preference and nobody's locally sourced or we're both locally sourced. And we've got a tie with the autonomous system path and we've got a tie with the origin code. Then and only then will we use the multi-exit discriminator. And we might see this used if we have two connections going to a single ISP, maybe a primary connection and a backup connection. But the same ISP is receiving our MED advertisements from us over each link. What we can do is use a lower MED on the preferred link and put a higher MED on the less preferred or the slower link going to that internet service provider. And that could influence inbound path selection decisions from that ISP. Next up is PaaS. We're going to prefer an eBGP path. In other words, a BGP route that was sent between two different autonomous systems. We're going to prefer that over an iBGP or an internal BGP path where we have a couple of neighbors that are members of the same autonomous system and they exchange routes. That's an iBGP path. And if everything is a tie, and oftentimes it is, if everything is a tie, then we're going to go with the router ID. Here, the lowest router ID is going to be preferred. And we can let the routers just automatically select one based on the IP addresses that we have, or we can set it. I generally think it's a good idea in the real world to, to set your own router ID. And with this understanding of what that acrostic means of we love oranges as oranges mean pure refreshment, let's go out to the output of a show IP BGP command and see if we can make sense of those different path attributes. Let's begin with the we in the acrostic. We, the W reminds us of the W in weight, remembering that the higher the weight, the more preferred. The default is zero, except notice that we've got one network there with a weight of 32768, and that's because it's locally attached. So locally attached networks, they automatically get a higher weight because they're going to be more preferred. But that's the W. We're looking for a path that has the highest weight if we have two or more paths to get to a destination network. If that's a tie, though, we say we love. The L in love reminds us of the L in local preference. Again, higher is better. 
There is not a local preference assigned by default, but we can insert our own values if we want to. And here it looks like we've assigned a local preference of 100 to a couple of routes. But if we still have a tie, we love oranges. Now this is the first use of the word oranges and this refers to originate. Did this originate on our router or somewhere else? This is a binary decision. Did it come from us or did it come from somebody else? Here, because we have all zeros as the next top, we know that this particular route came from us. So we love oranges as, the as, the AS reminds us of the autonomous system path. And we can see that in order to get to network 5.5.5.0/24, for example, we can go through 65,002 and then go into 65,003 and we're going to find that network within that autonomous system. But if you look further down, you'll see that there's one route that has three autonomous systems listed. If we were trying to choose two ways of getting to the network and one had three autonomous systems listed and the other had two autonomous systems listed and everything else had been a tie up to this point, yeah, we're going to go with the one with the shortest autonomous system path. So we love oranges as oranges. Here's the second use of the word oranges in our acrostic. This one is the origin code and we see it over here at the right hand side. Even the codes shown in the little help up above says that I means IGP, E means EGP, and question mark means incomplete. Again, the way I want you to think about this for the real world is that I means that somewhere on some router, this route was injected into BGP using the network command. It was not redistributed from OSPF or EIGRP or something like that. It was the network command that injected this into BGP. Again, I predict you'll never see an E here because that literally means you learned it from the very, very outdated EGP that was named EGP. And if there's a question mark, that's going to indicate that this route was redistributed. And an I is better than an E, and an E is better than a question mark. If we still have a tie, we love oranges as oranges mean. The M in mean reminds us of the M in metric. This is our MED, our multi-exit discriminator. And this is a way for us to advertise our routes along with different meds to influence inbound path selection. Here, unlock local preference and weight. Here, a lower metric is better. But if we still have a tie, we love oranges as oranges mean pure. The P is the PAS. Meaning, did I learn this route from a BGP neighbor in my own autonomous system? That would be learning it via iBGP. Or did I learn it from a neighbor in another autonomous system? That would be eBGP. Well here, this I that I have highlighted on screen, that tells me that I learned this route from a BGP neighbor that's in my own autonomous system. And an I is going to be less authoritative, it's going to be less preferred than a route that we learn from a router in another autonomous system. So if we have to choose between one of those two to get to a destination network, we're going to go with the one that's not flagged with an I. And as our final tiebreaker, we love oranges as oranges mean pure refreshment. That's our router ID. It can be chosen automatically, but I think it's a good practice to put in our own router ID and we can see it up top. Here we've assigned to router R3 the router ID of 3.3.3.3. Oh, by the way, there are a few other things going on in that left-hand column that you might want to check out. The star simply means that this is a valid route. But in some places, we have an R. That means a rib or a route information base, a rib failure. That sounds bad, doesn't it? Actually, it's usually not a bad thing. A rib failure simply means that this route was not taken from the BGP table and injected into the router's IP routing table. Maybe that was because the router had a better source of that information. And you see the greater than sign? The greater than sign says, of all the routes that BGP knows about to get to this particular network, the greater than sign is going to indicate that this is the preferred route. All right, that's a look at the theory of BGP and a look at how BGP makes its path selection decisions. Now let's go out to a live interface and do a basic BGP configuration. And it's going to establish a neighborship between a couple of BGP routers. And we're going to be able to exchange routes. And that's what the Encore Exam Blueprint says you need to know. In this topology, we've got router R1 that lives in autonomous system 64,500. We've got R2 that lives in autonomous system 64,495. Let's configure each router. And again, we can accomplish our task of setting up a neighborship and advertising a network to our neighbor with just three commands per router. Let's go into router R1's global config. And here's command number one of three. We need to start the BGP routing process. And we do that by saying router BGP. 
And I'm going to give the autonomous system number of this router, which is 64,500. Now in BGP router configuration mode, I need to specify the IP address of my neighbor. That's command 2 of 3. And to do that, I'll say neighbor and router R2 has an ingress interface of 198.51.100.2, so I'll use that. And I'm not done yet. I need to say in what autonomous system does this router live? And it lives in the autonomous system of 64,495. Now, notice I said remote AS, and in this case, yeah, that's a different autonomous system. But even if I were pointing to somebody within my own autonomous system, that would be an iBGP neighbor, I would still say remote AS, even though it's not really remote. You still have to say remote AS, and then we would specify our own autonomous system number. But that's for iBGP. The Encore exam blueprint says we only need to know about eBGP. Now, that was command two of three. Here's the third and final command. I need to advertise a network. I'm going to say network, and I'm going to advertise that network off of the top of R1, which is 192.0.2.0, and I'm going to specify a subnet mask. Now, this is different than you've learned about with OSPF or EIGRP, where you're giving a wildcard mask. Here, this is actually a subnet mask, and we preface it with the keyword of mask, and it's going to be a mask of 255.255.255.0, so a 24-bit subnet mask. Now, another difference between this and OSPF or EIGRP, when we talk about OSPF giving the network command or EIGRP giving the network command, I always try to emphasize to my students that command is not saying to OSPF or EIGRP, it is not saying I want to advertise this network. Instead, what it's doing is specifying an IP address space. And it's saying, if I have any interfaces on this router that are up and their IP address falls within this address space that I've just defined, then I want that interface to advertise its network inside of this routing protocol. And I try to make a big point when I teach OSPF and EIGRP that we're not saying advertise this network. However, with BGP, that is exactly what we're saying with the network command. I'm literally saying I want to advertise this network and inject it into BGP. And that is command number three of three. How easy was that? Now, I'll do this next one a lot quicker because I won't give as much commentary as we go through it. Let's go into global configuration mode. Let's start the BGP routing process by saying router BGP, giving R2's autonomous system number of 64,495. And I'm going to specify my neighbor R1. My neighbor has an IP address of 198.51.100.1. It is in the remote Autonomous system of 64,500. One command to go. I want to advertise the network. Oh, oh, look at that. We just had a BGP adjacency come up. So that's good news. Now I want to advertise the network of 203.0.113.0 with a mask, a subnet mask, not a wildcard mask, of 255.255.255.0. And we are done. Let's see if we've learned anything via BGP. I'll do a show IP route. We know that something has been learned via BGP if it shows up in our IP routing table with the B code. And sure enough, we have a route that has been learned via BGP, and it's that route off the top of R1. Notice the 20 right here. What is that? Well, that's the administrative distance. That's how authoritative this routing source is. And eBGP, external BGP, is very authoritative. The lower the administrative distance, the more believable a routing source. EBGP has an AD of 20, which is much less than EIGRP at 90, and OSPF at 110, and ISIS at 115, and RIP at 120. Now, IBGP, we said that was going to be less preferred. It's got a much higher administrative distance of 200. Now, let's take a look at the output of that show IP BGP command. That's going to show us the BGP topology table. And in this basic network, we don't have two ways of getting to a destination network. So we don't have to say, okay, who has the highest weight and the highest local preference and so on. And BGP has two networks in its BGP table right now. We have this one that was learned from R1. In fact, we see R1's IP address as the next hop to get there. And notice the autonomous system path. We're saying we have to go into 64,500 and that's where this lives. This route was injected into BGP by a network command on some router, and that router is R1, we see that the originate of all zeros here says that this was sourced on our router. 
Yeah, we gave the network command for that one, and as a result, we also have a higher weight to go along with that. And now that we've covered everything you need to know about BGP for the Encore exam, I want to give you a resource that you can use to study. So I've created a really short PDF that has that slide I showed you a few moments ago that identifies where those eight different path attributes show up in the output of the show IP BGP command. And the PDF also has what those different eight path attributes refer to. And it also includes the configuration of the BGP demo that we just went through. And the link is in the description down below. So just go to that link below, give me your email if you would, and I'll email that PDF right out to you. And you can use that for your study. And I want to give you a big thank you for joining me for this look at the Encore coverage of BGP. And until next time, I hope you stay safe and stay curious.